right, we'll get started. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Uh, welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. I'm Yuval Levin. I'm Director of Social, Cultural, and Constitutional Studies here at AEI, and it's uh, my great pleasure tonight to host this discussion with Lee Drutman about his important new book, Breaking the Two-Party Doom Loop. Um, Lee is a political scientist, uh, Berkeley PhD, a senior fellow in the political reform program at New America. He writes regularly for Vox, for 538, for many other prominent outlets. Uh, his previous book, The Business of America is Lobbying, uh, won the American Political Science Association's Robert Dahl Award in 2015. He also teaches at Johns Hopkins University. And this new book begins really from the reality of our intensely polarized, often dysfunctional politics, and offers both a profound diagnosis of that problem and some practical electoral reforms that Lee thinks could help to get our system back on track. We'll hear about both of those. We'll think about whether they're practical, what they might involve, what kinds of challenges they might face. Our format is very straightforward. Lee's going to speak first, lay out the case he makes in the book, uh, some thoughts about it, and then he and I will chat about it a little bit up here, and then we'll open it up to the rest of you for some Q&A. Uh, so very nice and simple. Thank you all for being here. And uh, to get us started, let's welcome Lee Drutman. All right. Well, thank you, Yuval, for having me. It's a, it's a thrill to be here and uh, a real delight to talk about my new book, Breaking the Two-Party Doom Loop. Uh, so any of you folks worried about the future of American democracy? Yeah, a lot, a lot of people seem to be kind of worried about the future of American democracy these days. I, I am as well, which is why I wrote this book. And in writing this book, I was really trying to answer three big questions. One, well, how worried should we really be at this particular moment? Uh, two, why now? Why are we having what feels like a major crisis of American democracy at this moment? And what could we do to, to resolve it? And the short answer to those three questions is, uh, should we be worried? Yeah, I, I think we should be worried. I think what we're experiencing now is this dangerous, escalating hyperpartisanship that that is a real threat to our democracy. Uh, why now? I argue in the book that that what's unique about this current era in American politics is that for the first time we have a genuine two-party system with two truly distinct parties, not overlapping, not multiple parties within parties, but two truly distinct national parties. And this is something that's new. It doesn't work with our political institutions. And frankly, it's driving us all crazy. Uh, what can we do about it? Well, the solution, I think, is to change how we vote in order to expand the number of parties. Uh, the reason that we have two parties is not because Americans want just two parties. It's that we have a voting system that tends to, towards just two parties. And I, I actually don't think this should be such a radical suggestion. One, for most of our political history, we had something like a multi-party system within the two-party system. Uh, two, around the world, multi-party democracy is the norm. The US is the strange outlier country. And three, as I'll argue, I, I think it's actually much more consistent with the design of our political institutions and what the framers wanted to see American democracy look like. So let's start with the crisis, the current problem. Uh, the diagnosis is hyperpartisanship. And this is bigger than the 2016 election. This is bigger than the 2020 election. And this is about having two parties that represent two very contrasting ideas of what America ought to be and with cores in very different geographies. We have the Democratic Party, the party of urban cosmopolitanism, the party of diversity, multiculturalism, increasingly secular, uh, increasingly oriented towards the, the global knowledge economy. Uh, and you have the Republicans, the party of rural and exurban America, much more white, much more religious, much more uh, traditionalist in its values, and representing places that are increasingly left behind by the global knowledge economy. And those two parties are tugged to their core and create a very uh, high stakes clash over what value system, what vision of America will prevail. And this is a high stakes clash because to have a narrow majority means that you can potentially impose your will 
on the, 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 the losing half. And so it, it creates this high stakes feeling, whereas if the other party gets in power, they're, they're going to threaten our values, our, our way of life, our vision of what America stands for. And if our side gets into power, we better use that power uh, to impose that vision. And this creates incredibly high stakes, incredibly uh, emotional politics, and a sense that the other party is not an opponent to disagree with. The other party is an enemy to be crushed. This leads to uh, increasing escalation of political hardball tactics. It leads to a sense that you, you can't even associate with somebody on the other side, increasing social isolation, increasing epistemological isolation, and an increasing breakdown of a basic sense of fairness and shared truth on which democracy depends. We can disagree. It's healthy to di disagree. It's healthy to have conflict. What's unhealthy is when we have no way of resolving that conflict because we can't agree on what's fair and what's legitimate. And, and at some point, democracy begins to crumble under that hyperpartisanship, under that breakdown of shared fairness. This is how democracies die. This is a dangerous situation. And there is no resolution within our two-party system. Neither party is going to become the dominant majority anytime soon, but both parties think they are, or in fear, and even more, fear that the other party would. Uh, so why now? My argument in the book is that what is unique about this period is that we have this genuine, nationalized two-party system. Now, I know we've always had a two-party system in the US, but for a long time, what we had was a uh, coalition of two parties that were broad coalitions and overlapping. There were collections of state and local parties that at a national level were somewhat incoherent. And the longstanding criticism of, Amer of American party politics was not that the parties were too far apart, is that they were indistinguishable from each other and voters didn't have clear and meaningful choices because the parties kind of didn't really have, have any clear, coherent national vision. Uh, now, uh, the, the moment that we're in is a product of a long realignment of American politics that began in the civil rights era and continued to today. Uh, and uh, you know, parties reorganized along social cultural lines, uh, along geography, and, and a nationalization of American politics that we used to have a, a diverse pluralism of, of local parties that stood, you know, the Democratic Party of Mississippi was, Democrat, was very different than the Democratic Party of New York, and the Republican Party of Vermont was very different than the Republican Party of Kansas. Uh, and, you know, again, that didn't necessarily work for voters who didn't have clear choices, but that pluralism filtered into Congress and allowed for different coalitions to work on different issues. And I would argue that from the mid-1960s through the late 80s, we had something more like a four-party system with liberal Republicans and conservative Democrats alongside conservative Republicans and liberal Democrats. And you could build different coalitions on different issues. Uh, Congress, as a result, was a little bit more decentralized, a little bit more committee-oriented, or invested more in itself, was more balanced with the executive branch. But as politics polarized, as the parties sharpened their national images, uh, we lost that diversity within the parties. And Republicans from the Northeast, who used to, be, used to be the home of liberal Republicans, began to go extinct. Democrats from the South and rural America used to be the home of conservative Democrats, began to go extinct. And uh, this was a function of the nationalization of politics, the shift towards culture war politics, and also a function of our winner-take-all, single-winner plurality elections, in which once the Democratic Party fell down to, you know, in the low 40s in a lot of parts of, of rural America and Southern America, they, they stopped being competitive. So, you know, why invest resources in races you can't win? The Democratic Party as an institution dried up in a lot of those places. Similarly, with the Republican Party throughout New England, some of the coasts, some, some of, of, of urban America, uh, we can't win those races anymore, so we're not even going to run candidates. And the parties now compete for a very few number of districts in the states. The number of swing states, the number of, of swing districts has shrunk. The result is that most Americans don't get to cast a vote that is even potentially meaningful. Parties are not targeting uh, most of America. They're targeting a very narrow group of, uh, of Americans. 
And primaries have become much more important because in, in districts that are not two-party competitive, the primary looms much larger. Uh, so all of those trends have combined to, to give us a, a moment of unique, true two-party politics, evenly balanced, in which both sides think if only they can push harder, they will get that elusive majority. But it hasn't worked out very well for either party. Uh, we've gone through a pendulum of unified government for one party, divided government, unified government for the other party, divided government, unified government. Both parties think at some point they're going to get that, that you know, emerging majority, but it, it's elusive. And pushing for it is a, is a process of hyper-escalation. It's what I call the, the doom loop. And this is, again, a very dangerous situation for a democracy. So the question is, how do we break it? The answer is expand the number of parties. Break the zero-sum dynamic in which you have two sides who think if only they could push harder, they will get that elusive uh, majority. Now, I think some people might view this as a, as a, as a radical suggestion. I would say, one, it, again, it's, it's just returning to the system that we had for a long time, but formalizing it more. Um, two, most countries use it. And you know, it is the vision that our framers uh, would have wanted, I think. Now, my reading of Mad Madison Federalist 10 is, t is a vision of multi-party democracy. Because what Madison says is that, look, there are factions in society, and factions are essential. That's liberty, uh, is the ability for factions to participate. But we have to set up a government so that no faction is dominant and no single faction is dominated. What the framers feared when they feared political parties was that there was going to be a majority party that would impose its will on a minority party, and a minority party that would view the government as illegitimate as a result. Framers were students of history. They had seen how self-governance can devolve into civil war when a situation just like this happens. And they wanted to prevent that, so they wanted to prevent political parties from forming. Now, what we know from the modern era is that it's really hard, probably impossible, to have a modern mass democracy without political parties. Political parties are fundamental institutions for democracy to work because they organize citizens, they structure alternatives, they engage people, they make politics accessible, and they are incredibly important institutions. Uh, and the framers made it hard for political parties because they didn't want them to form, so they set up uh, a system to, to frustrate them. It was uh, federalism plus bicameral legislature plus separation of powers. That made it really hard for coherent parties to form for a long time. I would argue about 200 years. It's only in the modern era in which we've had truly coherent nationalized parties. Uh, so the system worked pretty well in that respect for a long time. But there's no going back to that. American politics has fully nationalized now. Uh, the only way forward is, is to change how we vote. Now, at the time of the Constitutional Convention, there was but one voting system that anybody knew of, which was plurality voting, the 1430 invention that was used in, in Britain. And so they imported it. There's nothing in the Constitution that says we have to have that voting system. There's nothing in the Constitution that says we have to have two parties. It was just how things evolved given the voting system. Proportional representation wouldn't be invented until the early 19th century. It wouldn't be adopted in any country until 1899. Belgium became the first country to adopt it. And then it spread throughout Western Europe in the first two decades of the 20th century. And now it's the norm among most advanced democracies. Uh, and there are lots of systems of proportional representation. I'm not recommending that we become Israel, which has hyper PR that generates 17 parties and way too much fracture. Uh, the system that I recommend in this book is a, is a moderate form of proportional representation. It's ranked choice voting in multi-member districts. It's a system used in Ireland. It's a system used in Australia. I expect that we would probably get between four and six parties if we used it. I estimate five in the book. Uh, and I think a moderate form of PR would, would be a good thing. Uh, I think, you know, I mean, one, it would work with our political institutions, which demand that coalition building and that compromise, which is endemic to multi-party democracy, where no one party thinks it's going to be the majority 
and no one party is worried about being a permanent minority and instead you build coalitions in a fluid manner. Uh, I, I also think it, it would address another endemic problem of American democracy, which is the fact that we have incredibly low voter participation in this country compared to most advanced democracies. We have a lot of people who are incredibly disengaged from the political process. And that, I think, is a, is a very dangerous thing. Uh, and uh, uh, if you look at proportional multi-party democracies, voter turnout is much higher uh, because, one, there are more parties that are around, so people are more likely to feel like there's a party that represents them. Uh, and two, there are no swing districts because every vote counts in our system uh, based on plurality versus past the post elections. Most districts and most states are lopsided one party or another, so there's just not a lot of real competition in our political system, even though it's fiercely competitive at the national level. At the local level, there's a lot of one party dominance, and that's not really democracy. Uh, I think there ought to be more of a contest of ideas, there ought to be more of a competition uh, for ideas, and there ought to be more pluralism in our system. Uh, I mean, the ideological diversity of America is not well represented in the current Congress. Uh, also, with a multi-party proportional system, gerrymandering, which is a, is a serious problem, becomes basically impractical to impossible. Uh, gerrymandering is only a function of having two parties in, that are with predictable partisan voting in single member districts and gives you lots of options to draw districts in funny ways to make your party get more of the votes. Um, you know, so I think it, it, it makes a lot of sense. Now, at this point, perhaps you're skeptical or perhaps you agree with me and think, well, okay, it sounds like a reasonable idea, but I mean, come on, really? How, how, how is this ever going to happen? Because, you know, we can barely pass a budget on time, and you're saying we should change the way we vote. Um, I mean, I, I don't think reform is going to come out of Washington. It, it never, big democracy reform never comes out of Washington. It comes out of the states. Uh, and I think we're already seeing experimentation at the state level. Maine has moved to ranked choice voting. Massachusetts may, I think, will have a ballot initiative this year. Other states can experiment with. And this is, this is what has happened throughout our political history, that we have had these moments in which you know, we, we've changed our, our democracy. And I think for the better, we've made it more participatory. We've made it uh, more responsive. And you know, nothing, we, we tend to think that the institutions that we have today are somehow set in stone, but they're not. Uh, we, we've, we, we've evolved and we will continue to evolve uh, in order to, to conserve the pluralism of, of American democracy. So, you know, I, I, I think, you know, in the years ahead, and, and I do believe this, that we are at a moment in which people are going to be asking some really big questions about how, how does our democracy look in the future. Uh, there, there will be an opening for reform. Americans have never been more dissatisfied with how our democracy is going in the history of modern polling. Share of people who want more than two parties is at about two-thirds of Americans. And more Americans than ever are choosing not to identify as either Democrats or Republicans. So I think there is hunger for structural reform. And I do believe that we need big structural reform. That it, it, the, the, Maintaining the status quo as it is is a very dangerous thing given the intense hyperpolarization and where that leads us. And I think the only way out is to change how we vote, to allow more parties, and to allow new coalitions to potentially emerge that are not so zero sum. Uh, so, in, in writing this book, uh, I hope to start a conversation, and I think that conversation starts right about now. <laughs> Thanks very much, Lee. A great summary um, and really a great book. Congratulations. Well, thank you. Um, I think this is a book that will be the place to go on electoral reform for a long time. Uh, and I, I have to say, too, just looking at it, th th one of the striking things about this book is how it treats the existing literature on this question, which is vast and immense. And you know, great lit review isn't something you put on the back of a book. But <laughs> it, it is a very impressive part of this. And I think if you really want to know what's out there, um, this is a very, very good place to go and makes a strong case for its way of thinking. I want to 
I want to poke a little bit at some of the assumptions uh, yeah. that, that drive the book, um, and then also open things up for questions from the room. We've got a great collection of people here in the audience. Um, it, stepping back from the particulars, is it fair to say that the book is premised on the notion that the, the problem of polarization is really rooted in our political elites and the systems they operate in, not in the public, so that a more representative American democracy would be less polarized? Yeah, I, I do believe that. I, I think that, I mean, looking at the literature, a lot of the polarization started at the elite level. Now, the, the Americans have become more polarized over this period, but voters tend not to be as ideological as political elites are. And I think the ideology for most voters follows the political elites. I mean, we, we can look at how a lot of Republican voters moved in response to Donald Trump taking very different positions than have traditionally been taken by Republicans. And so I think one of the reasons that voters have become so polarized is that the, the range of elite opinion has polarized tremendously uh, over the last several decades. And voters look to elites, for the most part, to decide what they should think or at least they're constrained in their political choices by what elites do. And there are certainly no rewards in our political system for moving to the political center or to having a, a, an original heterodox view because you can't really do that within either of the two parties. So I, I do believe that if we expanded the number of parties, we would see some more heterodox views that don't quite fit the, the left-right axis uh, we would see a new party of the center emerge, and we would see a, a new flexibility that part of the reason that things are so nasty is because we see each other uh, in, in this very negative partisanship lens that it's, well, you know, Democrats think, well, whatever Donald Trump does, I'm against, you know, for a while, Republicans thought, whatever Barack Obama does, I'm against. And in a two-party system, it's much easier to be against something because that's the thing that unifies your side than it is to be for something because that's harder to forge that compromise. And you know, I, I think there, there is actually a lot more diversity within both of the parties than we see on display because nobody votes on anything. And so much of the agenda is controlled and constrained in order to whip party line votes and avoid the issues that would, that would divide the parties. And that's why we have so much stasis and, and gridlock. And if we had the full panoply of ideas and perspectives out there, I think people would start to consider other ideas. I mean, one of the challenges is that we live in this uh, binary epistemological world in which to cross the aisle is to be a traitor. But in a more, slightly more fragmented, not too fragmented, but like four to six fragmented uh, world, you, you could see going one party to the left or to the right or, or in another dimension, and, and you'd be more open to ideas. You, you would engage in the complexity inherent in public policy and the trade-offs in a way that you, it becomes hard to do when to question your side becomes an act of treason. So how, where do these kinds of reforms fall in the tradition of American political reform? There's a way of telling the story of how we got here that says that we've had a series of reforms aimed at democratization, at letting the public have more of a say and making the system more representative. And each of those has actually made our politics more polarized, has tended to empower groups at the margins at the expense of a kind of cohesive mainstream, and therefore has actually driven us to the edges rather than to the center, even though the purpose was democratization and representation. Aren't you proposing a step in the same path? Uh, or do you worry that what, you, what this leads to is actually a, a more divided politics in the way that primaries created a more divided politics, in the way that various kinds of democratizing reforms have done that in the, in the past half century? Well, I'm not sure our politics could get much more divisive than it is now. Um, and I mean, yeah, so primaries came around in you know, 19, 1910s. Uh, polarization actually declined for almost 70 years following the introduction of, of primaries. So, you know. But really, primaries in place of powerful party conventions. And yeah. Is I mean, so, I mean, at a, at a presidential level, congressional at a, at primary. At a presidential level, yeah. At a presidential level. Although, I mean, I, I would say that for the most part, parties nominated more moderate candidates 
until recently. And in fact, the year before the, the 68 fracas, Republicans nominated Barry Goldwater, who was a, a, at that time considered an extremist yeah. candidate. And they did so because delegates for Goldwater overwhelmed the party operation. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, parties are coalitions and either they can be taken over by extreme factions. I mean, so, so I, you know, I, I think there are trade-offs in the, in the level of, of how much pub, the public should participate and how much it should be mediated. And, and I agree with you that we've gone too far towards plebiscitory democracy. Um, I think one of the things that I, I actually like about multi-party democracy is I think it creates stronger parties. Now, I think one of the reasons that American political parties are weak is because there's just two of them. Mm -hmm. And in order to lead a party, you have to lead this incredibly broad coalition, and it means you, you can't afford to take strong stances and alienate people and define certain people out of bounds of the party. In, 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 in multi-party systems, Parties can actually afford to. They're not trying to win a, a, a winning plurality of the vote. They're trying to stay true to a particular vision, and they can afford to to say certain people are out of bounds of the uh, of the of the party. And and in this book, I do propose getting rid of congressional primaries mm -hmm. um, uh, because I, I do think that in in the current system, they've they've become uh, forces for extremism. And I think the the democratic rationale for having primaries was in the progressive era, the idea that the parties were captured, were both captured by the same elite bosses and there was no way to, to engage in, in productive dissent within a two-party system and that the, the primaries created a, a vehicle for dissent. And actually they, they squelched a lot of the energy from incipient third parties and maybe one reason why we maintained a two-party system, I mean, look at Donald Trump, he ran as a Reform Party candidate, mm -hmm. and then he realized you, you got to run it as a Republican. Uh, so I, I think you, you actually, with with multiple parties, then you have a, a, a route for for dissent and alternative viewpoints in a way that you, you wouldn't get in a two-party system. You point in the book to the fact that this is done in other countries as an argument in its favor. Isn't it also an argument against expecting this to dramatically lessen the polarization of our politics? Aren't those other uh, multi-party democracies also polarized, also subject to the kind of populist forces we see here, also basically having the same kinds of problems we have now? Um, well, I'd say two things. One, I don't think polarization is necessarily bad. Uh, and you know, in some ways, it can be helpful to have a, a range of, of, of views represented. The, the danger is when there's no way to, to find a compromise because you have two extreme sides that are both competing for narrow power. And you can, you can envision a polarized uh, multi-party system in which there are a range of parties and you can build different coalitions. And yes, I think that European party systems are experiencing some of the same shocks that, that we are experiencing here. Uh, sort of rise of 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 populism, uh, but in the European party systems, uh, new parties can rise and fall. Uh, uh, new parties can rise, old parties can fall, and what you see in France and Germany and Sweden uh, you know, is a situation where new new coalitions are forming, or or the parties of the center are kind of joining to to keep out the extremists. And you know, that's that's to me a the, the question is not are these forces challenging uh, Western democracies? Right. They are. I, and the question is what type of party system is better situated to withstand it? it you know, if you if you think about a building being earthquake resistant, the way to make it earthquake resistant is to have a lot of moving parts that can adjust. Uh, the most dangerous thing is to just have two pillars and and it falls over. And I think the, the, the danger in our system is that these are, uh, throughout Western democracies, are, we're having a, a conflict over culture. Mm -hmm. And that's a dangerous conflict because it can become very zero sum. But the way to make that even more zero sum and more dangerous is to say, well, we're only going to give you two sides and they're both going to take extreme visions of, of who's going to win the culture war and go fight it out with no space in the middle. 
And that's what we're doing in the US. And that's what it looks like the UK, which is also a first past the post two-ish party system, is, is about to do. How, does, how do these kinds of reforms interact with our presidential system? A lot of what yeah. you write about is really about Congress. And the models that exist in other countries are basically parliamentary models. What does a presidential election look like in, a, in an American politics with four or five parties? Well, in order, there's a, in order for that to work really well, we need ranked choice voting for president, which we don't have right now, or some form of fusion balloting. Um, you know, what I expect would happen is that we would see sort of the more or less similar coalitions to what we have that join up to, to nominate presidential candidates, but you, you'd see a little more flexibility in, in that, and you'd see candidates running more, more to the center than, than to, the, to the wings. Um, I mean, the, the, one of the reasons that I got onto this topic, and this is a, a, a shared interest that we both have, is, is the importance of Congress at, at, as the premier, the first branch of government, the, mm -hmm. the branch able to deliberate, to, repre to truly represent the pluralism of American democracy. And you and I have both written quite a bit about Congress's institutional decline. Uh, and I think a, a core part of Congress's institutional design and its, its brittleness, frankly, is the, the intense centralization, which is both a, a cause of and a consequence of the intense polarization and the way in which Congress has made itself increasingly irrelevant vis-a-vis -vis the executive branch because basically we have two, two potential situations. One in which Congress and the president are of the same branch, in which case Congress just says, well, we just got to do whatever the, makes the president look good. We're not going to challenge the president. And the other condition in which Congress and the, and the presidency are, are divided, in which case the Congress says, yeah, we're going to be a brick wall. We're, we're not, we're not going to entertain anything. We want the president to, to fail and look extremely bad, which then leads the president to just say, well, screw you. I'm going to do everything I can by executive action and go ahead and try to stop me. Uh, and that is a recipe for an increasingly strong president. Now, the, the, the experience of presidential democracy with multi-party system is common in Latin America. And a lot of people will say, well, that's, that's a problem. <laughs> uh, now, we're, we're not... You know, I, I think the, w any comparison to, to Latin American countries, given our, our history and our, our political culture, are, are you know, th these are different political cultures. Um, but one of the things that is unique about the U.S. Uh, on the, on, in the world of presidential democracies is, is the U.S. president is actually uh, pretty constitutionally weak. That the, the, cons the powers that the presidency has are the powers that Congress has given up. And when I look at the periods in which Congress was stronger, Congress was more decentralized. It was more committee-based. It invested more in itself. It was less top-down. Uh, and it was, that was the period in which we had more of a multi-party Congress. And what I, what I truly believe would happen is we would have something like that in which Congress would be a little bit more bottom-up. Uh, more committee-based, and b there would be more of a sense of, of an institutional loyalty rather than a partisan loyalty, because no party would be trying to become the narrow majority that totally punishes the other side, uh, and you'd, you'd get a, a, a stronger Congress. That, that's where I started thinking about this, and that's, that's mm -hmm. what I believe. So we would become, I think, a, a much healthier democracy as a result. It would take some dramatic changes in the way Congress works, too, right? The two-party system is deeply entrenched in every part of Congress. How do committees work with five parties? How do, who elects the speaker with five parties? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a coalition. Uh, it would be, you, I think you would see different coalitions emerge to support a speaker. And then you'd divide up committee assignments, uh, I think, based on that coalition. Mm -hmm. And you, you, with, no, with no one party dominant, you'd actually see a system in which you'd have more of an equality of different voices, and you'd have more of a bargaining table of, you know, among, among different parties, among different representatives, none of whom would feel like they need to screw the other side. But you, you'd get people working together, say, what, what, what can we agree on, or what can enough of us agree on that actually needs to get done? I, I think on, on, on a lot of the major issues, you know, climate, uh, immigration, dealing with the uh, opioid 
crisis, dealing with you know, economic change, that if members of Congress went into a room and they weren't trying to, to, to do the thing that was going to make their party win the next election, I think there's a lot more agreement than, than, we, than we see. But the problem is, in our system of, of two parties competing for narrow power, as soon as a member of Congress starts making bipartisan overtures or starts working on a deal, leadership comes and quietly says, you know, it's nice for you to have your fun project, but you know, you're blurring the message. And by the way, if you keep doing this, we're going to cut off funding for your reelection. Mm -hmm. So, so, but that 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 would be much less likely to happen in a multi-party Congress. So I think you'd see much more bottom-up, fluid political entrepreneurship. One of the ideas we propose here is one of my favorite reforms too, which is to significantly increase the size of the House of Representatives. It's not how most Americans think. When you look at Congress, you don't think, I just wish there were more of these people. <laughs> um, tell us why there should be more of these people. Well, you know, it's, it's a, a little known story that the, the actual First Amendment that James Madison proposed uh, was to have uh, a cap on how many uh, constituents a member could represent, and it was going to be 50,000. Mm -hmm. Now, that, that amendment came very close to being ratified. It, 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 had, it, had, it made through one, had it made it through one more house in Connecticut, we might have a house of 6,000 uh, today. Now, w what guided Madison in that vision was the idea that the House of Representatives should be the people's house, and it should be close to the people, and it, it, the representatives should really know the concerns of the people, and the people should have a, have a sort of ombudsman for, for government. And I think we're, you know, one of the reasons why people feel so disconnected from, from what goes on in Washington is because it's far away, and they don't, there's no, you know, they might have a problem with their Social Security check, but there's no person who comes and talks to them and explains. And one of the important roles of members of Congress is explainer and and. You know, I think it's hard, it's hard for them to truly, they can pick the constituency that they want to represent. Most of them can get safely reelected. You know, I, I think we should have a Congress that is, is closer to its people. And the U.S. Is a, is, a, is a true outlier here. We have about 765 constituents per member of Congress. India is a little higher on that, but next, next uh, largest after the U.S. is Japan at about 275,000, and then most European countries have about you know 100 or so, 100,000 or so constituents per representative. And you know, people tend to be happier with government when they can get a little bit more of a sense of, of what's going on and, and how it's working. Uh, so I, I, I think we I think that that's one thing that, that and and that's you know Congress did actually follow Madison's vision of increasing the size of the House from 1789 mm -hmm. through 1911, and then they capped it at 435. Somewhat arbitrarily, but they could change that. It's not in the constant. Yeah. Nothing, nothing, nothing that says it has to be 435 members. Do, do any of your reforms require constitutional amendments? No, I, I, I specifically limited myself to to reforms that would be constitutional because at this point, getting a constitutional amendment in these polarized times is mm -hmm. basically impossible. So tell us, if they all happen, what does election day look like for Congress? Election what, day, what happens? Uh, election day for Congress means that you would have, for, uh, for the House, you'd have, uh, I, I, I would like to see five member districts uh, in which, with ranked choice voting, with multiple parties running, and you look around and see who's running. You have a diversity of choices on display. Everything is competitive. There's a range of ideas. And you rank them in order of preference. And you send a, a much clearer signal about what's important to you. Uh, and for the Senate, you'd have ranked choice voting. So you'd also have more parties. And, and I think you would just see people much more engaged, much more, much more of a contest of ideas, much less zero-sum negative campaigning, trying to just disqualify the other side based on, on character alone. And I think you would have many more ideas in in the in the space, I mean, the only time we really get a debate over ideas is is in the is in the party primaries, uh, and I think I think even that doesn't represent the the full range. So I think it would just be a more innovative, competitive, creative democracy than we have now. What are the what are the five or so parties that you envision? What would they look like from from here to there? So 
what I imagine is that there would be a, uh, on the left you'd see something more like a, a Bernie Sanders, kind of Elizabeth Warren, Social Democrat Party. You'd see like a Pete Buttigieg, Amy Klobuchar, moderate Democrat, New Democrat Party. Um, you know, it's a little bit you know, more to the center. I think my, my sense is on the right, you'd probably see about three parties. I think you'd have a, you'd have a party that's like the uh -huh. Reform Conservative Party. Um, I think there'd be a party that's kind of like a, a, a Christian Libertarian Party. Uh, and, you know, and then I think you'd have a kind of populist nationalist party. And to get from here to there, you'd have to somehow get the existing parties to want this to happen. Isn't that the big challenge you face here? Yeah, I don't think, uh, the, so the existing parties are, are uh, not going to want this to happen. But, or at least the leadership of the existing party does not want this to happen. But I think one, and you talked to lots of members of Congress and- Alas. Yes. And, you know, I, I don't talk to as many as you do, but the ones I talk to all complain about how miserable it is. Is that your experience? Oh, yes. Yes. So it's not like members of Congress are loving the job and feel like this is a system that, that is really working really well. But I think it's challenging because they can't, they, they haven't been there for very long. They don't have the, the time to think beyond, you know, catching the next flight back to the district and then doing a bunch of meet and greets and then coming back and having a bunch of votes or hearings. And then, I mean, and so there, there's not time to think about, well, what else could we do? How else could we operate? I think, you know, the, the, one of the things I like about this reform is that it's the only democracy reform that, that is equal opportunity destroyer of both parties. It doesn't help one party or the other. It's a, it's a genuine peace treaty in, in a sense that we're going to both, both split up and, and recombine recom other ways. Uh, you know, I think it won't, won't start in Washington. It'll start as most reforms do at the state level. There are a lot of states that have initiatives where I think something like this would be quite popular. And there are a lot of states that are one party dominant, which actually I think are quite ripe for something like this. Because when you have one party dominance, what you have is a minority party that is totally shut out of power, and then a faction within the majority party that if it's the losing faction is shut out of power. So what you have in, in, in one party rule is actually minority rule, the majority of the majority becomes a minority. So I think you have a ripe condition for reform there. But you know, I think understandably, you know, reform is a, it, you know, you're mm -hmm. rolling the dice a little bit. Uh, you know, you don't know exactly what you're gonna get. You know the devil that you have, uh, but you don't know the devil that you don't have. And so part of, part of the way I view it is that the devil that we have is actually gonna destroy us. And that I, I can't guarantee the devil that we don't have isn't also going to destroy us, but I think it has a much better chance of, of saving us as a, as a thriving, pluralistic, healthy democracy. Well, I do want to open things up for questions, but as a final question for me, I, I'm struck, although you describe this as a battle of two devils, I'm struck reading this book that it is a hopeful book. It's a book that imagines an America where we take up pretty profound reforms of our system of government and where there is the kind of public engagement and, uh, and, and belief in the future to do that. Um, that's not a common view now, it seems to me. Is that your view? It is my view. I am hopeful about the future. I'm hopeful because of conversations like this and people like you and, and people who are really thinking beyond just winning the next election and thinking about what does the future look like. I mean, there are an incredible number of people in this country who believe in American democracy, who want it to work well. People are not giving up on American democracy. People are, are realizing that, whoa, this is something that we might have been taking for granted, but we actually want it to work well. We, we, we don't want authoritarianism. And you know, there, there is a, a new generation entering politics. Uh, uh, there's, you know, Changing, uh, changing media landscape, which has often been associated with reform, that is old voices vanish, new voices enter. Uh, you know, there, there is a, a, a breakdown of, of, of old hierarchies and old consensus, and that creates space for something new. I think what we're seeing with Trump is, is the shattering of the old order, 
And you know, it's, it's really up to us and the conversations that we have to think about what, what the new order is, is going to be. It's, it's there for the building. I think well, it's, it might be a time for, for building. Uh, maybe a time to build, yes. <laughs> Available for pre-order. Um, <laughs> Let's, uh, let's take some questions. I would only ask that you tell us who you are and that you try to the extent you can to formulate your question as a question. Uh, and we'll begin in the back there. There are a couple of microphones going around, so please wait for those. Hi, my name is Luke Phillips. I work with Better Angels. And my only question is, why is it better to do this Federalist 10 style um, reform of uh, like more factions? Why is it better to do it through more parties rather than more significant factions inside either major parties, such as you had throughout much of US history? Um, because I, I don't see a way in our current electoral system for those factions to be cross-cutting and overlapping as they used to be. That's the, the short answer. You just don't think it could happen within the parties? I don't think it could happen within the parties. I mean, there, there, is, there are factions within the parties, but the factions are on one dimension. And it's the, the, the left and the far left, and the right and the far right. And there's no space for overlap. If it, I mean, the, the, in, in the old system, there were liberal Democrats and conservative Republicans because we had a much, more, uh, much stronger state and local party system. Mm -hmm. And the parties were just these loose vessels. Uh, now the parties are, are much more nationalized, clear vessels. And so the, in order for, for those factions to have meaningful leverage, they have to be able to con convincingly say, I'm going to partner with the other side. And I, I don't see w what, what we've seen over the last 30 years is that all the members of Congress who might have partnered with the other side because they had some overlap have gradually gone away. And there's no viable path for many of them to get elected. And those who do get elected, you know, sometimes in a, I mean, we see some Democratic moderates who got elected mm -hmm. in, a, in a Democratic wave election. A lot of them will lose in the next Republican wave election. You'll get some Republican moderates. And so there's no continuity there for, for, a, for a moderate faction to emerge because it takes time. What you have is people who are desperately fighting for their reelection. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, Take another question up here in the front. Thank you. Um, I'm April Lawson, also with Better Angels. We work on healing the partisan divide. And I'd like to ask, uh, it seems like one of the obvious drivers of political polarization is cultural fragmentation, right? It's the fact that the big sort, the fact that we're all, um, the, the sort of mainstream culture has declined and there are now many more small pockets of people who are more homogenous. And that's how they identify identity politics, obviously, is a symptom of this too. What um, makes you think that having a multi-party system would improve that rather than just sort of calcifying those lines and creating a world where we have a, a Brooklyn party whose mascot is the pumpkin spice latte and a Rust Belt party that has, you know, the coal miners, their, you know, what, what, how would this, it seems to me like what you're talking about would decrease the incentive for uh, uh, compromise by taking away the big tent. Um, does that worry you? Uh, no. <laughs> um. <laughs> Uh, look, I mean, I, I mean, I think what what you describe is real. There has been there has been a, a, a increasing social sorting. More more than ever, people are surrounded by people who share their political beliefs. More than ever, people don't know. I mean, like half NBC did some poll. Like half of people haven't in the last year haven't talked to somebody with an opposing political belief. Um, you know, that that is a function of a, of a binary political system uh, sorted. By geography, and I think what would happen is like a little bit of fragmentation is is actually good uh, because it 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 breaks this this us versus them black and white thing and allows people to see in shades of gray. So I mean the the, the stereotypes that you, that you gave me are are stereotypes of a two party system, but actually there's a lot more diversity in you know, pumpkin spice latte, you know, liberal America. And there's a lot more diversity in coal miner, Rust Belt, you know, NASCAR America. But like we have those simple stereotypes because we only get to see one version of that. But I, I think what we'd find is that actually when we're not in this zero-sum battle to take control of power, we'd, 
we'd find that there are actually a lot more commonalities. I, I don't know if, if, if any remember the SNL episode of, of Black Jeopardy in which Tom Hanks plays a, plays a kind of you know, MAGA hat guy and then he like, realizes that he has a lot in common with like, you know, working class black people and they're like, oh, right? I mean, but, but the, the reason that, that we don't see that is because we get caught up in these, these binary stereotypes that are a function of both political teams trying to enforce loyalty. And when you have more teams and nobody is going to be trying to get that narrow majority, you allow for different coalitions to form and you get to see some of the commonalities that are obscured in the way that our politics happens in the way that a lot of that conflict and a lot of that agreement is censored from the top down in order to draw sharper distinctions in hopes of getting that narrow majority. Yes, right here. Hi, uh, David Krukoff, independent candidate for Congress in the District of Columbia. <laughs> Good luck. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I'm part of the National Association of Nonpartisan Reformers, and uh, the reform community is quite, for the most part, in lockstep with most of what you've discussed today. Um, one area of uh, debate within the reform community is concerning t term limits, and I'm not sure if you think they're they're um, constitutional or not, but the debate really surrounds the idea that institutional knowledge versus risk taking. So the risk, the people, many people in the reform community think that if you have term limits, you are more likely to take chances if you're a congressperson, and other people in the reform community think that if you don't have the institutional knowledge, you can't get anything done. Where do you fall on that discussion? I'm opposed to term limits, although I, I would be okay with like 30-year term limits. Um, I, I mean, I, I very much believe in the value of institutional knowledge, the value of repeat players, people who are there for the long term. I think what there, there's, there's tremendous political science evidence that suggests that it, in the states that have term limits, what you've seen is more power going to the executive, more power going to the bureaucracy, and more power going to lobbyists. Uh, I think the, 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 you know, the, the answer to term limits is, or the answer to, to, to extensive incumbency is not term limits, it's having more competitive elections, and that's what I believe proportional multi-party democracy would generate. Uh, you know, I, I just don't think that term limits are, 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 the, are the best way to, to, to get there. Okay. Let's take a question there at the end. My name is Silas Fulkarni. I'm the co-founder of an education equity nonprofit called Teaching Lab. Um, the, thing that, uh, the things that you're putting forward are really appealing, but you hit at the very end on this idea that you're going to have to ask the two-party system's permission to dismantle themselves. That seems like that's the non-starter why we, we have a book about it, but we don't have a party based on it, in my opinion. Um, I'd be curious, what do you think the obstacles or the um, opportunities are for creating uh, uh, new parties within the current context without electoral reform first. Particularly, there are a lot of functionally uncontested congressional districts in the country where you could run a party that isn't, uh, you know, the, the enemy that you hate so much, but they could potentially come and take in a few seats in Congress, or from defectors from the current parties who are dissatisfied and start a new organization that could uh, exist with a freestanding infrastructure already in place. I think it's a great idea, and somebody should do that. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I think, I, and, and I agree that I think there is there is a ripe opportunity for for a party that's neither the Democrats or the Republicans to go into you know urban America and say here here's an alternative uh, in in a lot of these safe seats uh, and and rural America. You know, I, I mean, the the challenge is is who who's going to fund a political party that is that is mostly guaranteed to to lose almost all of its elections. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I do think that if you wanted to get electoral reform, the, the best way would be to, to, to run a few spoiler candidates to highlight the fragility and the, and the inherent unfairness of the, of the first-past-the-post system. So I'm all for that happening. Uh, just, just do it to just, just you know, spoil the other party. <laughs> this was really one of the challenges in creating the constitutional system. And one of the amazing things about what happened there was that they did somehow get every office holder in the existing political system to basically accept a new political system. Some, some were holdouts, but on the whole, the, the political elites were for it basically because they were at the convention. Yeah, 
Well, that's that's and true. And maybe they, that's they, one way to get them in. And they excluded the people who were against it. Yeah. I mean, Hamilton and Federalist <laughs> One basically says the only problem with the system is that everybody in politics is against it. Uh, <laughs> and their interests are against it. So that's something like what you'd face in a more entrenched system, but well, there may be creative ways around it. Let's take another question. We need, need, some, we need another Hamilton and Madison. Well, that wouldn't hurt. Um, there's an argument that, that outside the left-right polarization of the country, another fundamental issue is whether or not we want to move toward a more majoritarian system where the will of the majority is carried out without obstacles, or whether we want to preserve or even strengthen checks and balances that require supermajoritarian uh, consensus for reform. And the two most obvious reforms in this area, one is people who say, let's get rid of the filibuster in the Senate, and the other is people who say, let's get rid, let's, let's allow Congress to change the size of the Supreme Court so the Supreme Court can't obstruct uh, the majority's view on, on things. And my question to you is, in, in, in view of all the different reforms you're talking about, what is your view about eliminating the filibuster, and what is your view about the option of uh, packing the Supreme Court? Um, I'm opposed to packing the Supreme Court. I mean, I think the court should just decide a lot fewer things than it does, that, that we, we kick a lot of stuff that we can't resolve to the court, I mean, I'd be for ten judges, uh, you know, five and five, so they can't, or so, you know, they can't a lot of stuff they can't resolve, and then they actually have to figure it out in the political sphere. Um, I, I, I am for eliminating eliminating this, the Senate filibuster, uh, but you know, I, I think in the in the broader sense, one of the reasons why I like the the multi party system is I actually think it it forces true majoritarianism. In, in a in a in a super majority way, like you actually have to build those broad coalitions. I think too much of our system is built on 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 the premise of narrow majoritarianism, which is if we just get you know that narrow fifty one percent power, we can stick it to the other forty nine percent, and that the illusion of being able to do that it is I think a, a very dangerous thing. Multi-party democracy, you actually have to build a, a broader consensus. Usually, you build a, a super majority, and you know, frankly, that's the way Congress used to work. I mean, from the and what I consider the, the the sort of golden age from the mid '60s to the late '80s, you look at all this landmark legislation, and it usually passes the Senate with 70, 80 votes. It usually passes the House with two thirds, and that's because the lawmakers actually did the hard work of years of coalition building. I'm trying to make sure a lot of people were brought on board, and they wanted the, the law to last. What has happened in recent years is Democrats pushed through the Affordable Care Act with no Republican votes, and guess what? Republicans say, you, you know, we want to we wanna overturn that. Now, Republicans pushed through tax cuts with you know, only Republican votes. What are Democrats going to do when they get back? And so we see this, this ping pong you know, politics, which is incredibly destabilizing, bad for the economy. What you want is that broad coalition building, because that's what has legitimacy and long-term buy-in. I mean, in those years, the Democrats had very large majorities, right? I mean, the, the, the 60s to the 80s are the golden age if you really like the great society. Um, it's not necessarily a golden age for Congress as Congress. Well, I mean, a lot, a lot of stuff was, was passed with large Republican support. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of that important legislation yeah. was passed with broad Republican support. So tell me why you're against the filibuster if, the, if, if larger than simple majorities are better. Isn't that the purpose of the filibuster? Well, I think you ought to build it through a, through a multi-party system. I think that's an, that's an artificial break on things. I mean, we already have bicameralism plus a presidential veto, adding the, the you know, I mean, that, that seems to me uh, enough to, you know, to, to force broad compromise, particularly if you had a multi-party system. Uh, you know, yep. it seems like a, you know, that, 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 that pushes things a little too far, I think. Other questions? Yeah, please. Hi, I'm Mike. Uh, my question is, you mentioned the zero-sum uh, kind of mentality that you see in a lot of people who are deciding whether or not to cast their votes. Do you think that um, a lot of that zero-sum mentality comes from the fact that um, 
government uh, is redist redistributing larger and larger amounts of wealth so that um, when people are considering to cast their vote, they have to think through how it's going to impact them economically as well as how it's going to impact them um, politically. I mean, you know, for example, I, I think a lot people, a lot more people um, are, you know, kind of, they don't really care about bathroom bills or um, uh, marriage rights or things like that as much as they care about, you know, um, how much money their next, you know, paycheck is going to bring in and things like that. Um, and I think that that incentivizes people to, you know, vote um, to kind of keep their wealth and vote to take wealth. And it, you know, I think it, I don't know, I think it introduces a lot more zero-sum aspects into politics. Um, I, I think the political science literature would disagree with you that most people are casting votes based on partisanship and identity, and, and very few people are voting solely on their economic interests. I, I would also note that I think, you know, the, the, you know, the, Government has the, the amount. I, I'm not. I'm not sure why you think the government is doing more redistributive stuff now. I mean, I think we've been doing it ever since the the New Deal. We've been doing an incredible amount of, of redistribution, and that has so so the, the the independent variable of more or less redistribution doesn't track the trends in polarization. Okay. Other questions? Let's uh, go over this side. Okay, Rick Leeds, I've just put up a page called Policy Researchers Forum, and basically what that's about is to allow unaffiliated researchers with referenced information, as well as affiliated researchers, to present information directly to the public. reason why I did that, over the years I've seen so many people, uh, there's such a lack of, uh, there are so many economic points that are not getting mentioned to the public, and ranked choice as well. I first learned about Ranked Choice. There was a Cato Institute event. It was like 10 years ago. It was about James T. Bennett's book from George Mason University called Not, Not Invited to the Party. You probably read it. Um, and since then, there were some Washington Journal programs on C-SPAN. That, that event was covered at, at, at Cato. Uh, there were some Washington Journal uh, prog uh, programs in the morning, which some people see, but there was no dedicated event until the recent one at New America, which you were at. Um, so my question is it's kind of about the media. Do you think that there's enough events taking place by the think tanks or discussions in general that C-SPAN can cover, or are the events not taking place? Is there not enough discussions, discussion happening? Uh, I mean, I think there's a lot of discussion happening. I mean, you know. Is the solution uh, more think tank? Uh, the, the solution is more <laughs> think tank discussions. Where, where are our funders? <laughs> okay. Let's uh, take a question back here. I was just wondering if, if you had more specific thoughts, if we're talking about, you know, changing the voting system, um, it kind of seems like what you're describing is consistent with what I've heard called a single transferable vote, but yes. there are a number other systems, and I wondered if you had thoughts on, you know, single transferable vote versus approval voting versus score voting, and what effect implementing the different types of systems would have. Um, yeah, so so the nerdy version for what I'm describing is is single transferable vote or STV. Um, I, <laughs> but you know, STV, yeah. Um, so, so I call it multi-winner ranked choice voting. Uh, I, I'm not a big fan of approval voting. Um, I, I, I think it winds up looking a lot like plurality voting in practice when you factor in strategic voting. I think score voting suffers from from those problems. Also, neither of those two have the same history of of, of demonstrated success as uh, STV uh, or multi-winner ranked choice voting. Uh, the other the other system that I that I have would have good things to say about is um, the, multi, the the mixed member proportional, which is what the German system is, and, and New Zealand also adopted that in the 90s, uh, which is basically you take our system of single winner districts and then you get a second vote, which is a party vote. That's a party list vote. And that that then parties get compensatory seats, so they wound up getting proportional representation on top of constituent representation. And you know, I, I could make the case 
for that as well, and I, I think that would be a, a good system. I like the ranked choice, the preferential aspect of the ranked choice voting, because I think it encourages more coalition building, because candidates are competing to be different people's second and third choices, and I think that's a positive. I think it allows voters to be more expressive uh, in their preferences, but I could see the case for, for a party list system in which parties, that, that would make parties stronger. How do you think these kinds of changes interact with the cultural divisions that we're living through, the, the, the polarization that's not simply electoral, but that seems to be a, a, a breakdown of, uh, of American culture into two hostile camps? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think that, that, is a, uh, that is reflecting our politics rather than, than driving our politics. I, I mean, I think the, the, the blue versus red divide is a, a function of, of having these high stakes owning the libs or, you know, you know, everything is anti-Trump, right? I mean, that, 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 be, that infuses our culture. And, you know, I mean, you, know, you, you don't have to go far around D.C. to find somebody spraying fuck Trump on a, on a you know, on, on a side somewhere. And, like, you know, I'm like, come on. Like, really? But that, that, that in, infuses so much of the of the thinking is that we just, we just have to screw the other person. And I think that does filter down to our culture. And it, you know, I, I mean, I think, I think we're, we, we are more complex than this binary that is imposed on us. And I think that complexity is a good thing and that ought to come through because it forces us to think and engage. And when we see things in black and white, we shut down because we know everything about the other side because we have these simple stereotypes. Uh, and that, that becomes very dangerous, I Let's think. Take, uh, one more question, if we can. Yeah, right here. Hi, I'm Mary Elizabeth Halper. I'm with the Hurt Talk Foundation. And my question for you is, what other institution should we strengthen in order to propel the kind of reform that you're talking about with the institution of parties at the local level? Where else should we be doing our building? Well. You know, I mean, I think I think investing in in parties and institutions is a is important. Investing in Congress, um, you know, and investing in, in civic organizations. I mean, I think they're they're you know, the, the people people are hungry to engage in their community and and their democracy. And you know, it, it I, I think the the more opportunities, the the more organizations there are. To, to, to channel that spirit into something common, something beyond oneself is, is valuable. And so, yeah, I mean, I think there are a lot of opportunities. I mean, I, I believe in strengthening institutions, as, as you've all does, I know. Uh, and, yeah. Let me ask you to close. What, what, where does this begin? If, on the path that you want to lay out, what's a first step? What should someone who's listening to you do in their own community? What might be the most doable of these reforms as, uh, as a start? Where would you begin? I, I, I mean, I would begin at the local level. I mean, you could, I mean, cities have been adopting ranked choice voting and, and changing their electoral systems for, for a decade and a half, and that just happened in New York City. Uh, it's catching on. I mean, at the state level, it's a little bit more work, but, you know, I think, I think that's a lot more feasible. I don't think I don't think change on or leadership on this is going to come out of Washington. It's going to come out of the country uh, and out of the cities and states uh, at, where where innovation and political innovation has always started. Lee Drupman, thank you very much. Thank you all of you for coming. Thank you. Appreciate it.